Well, a wealthy English family once invited friends to spend some time at their beautiful estate. The happy gathering was almost plunged into a terrible tragedy on the first day. When the children went swimming, one of them got into the deep water and was drowning. Fortunately, the gardener heard the other screaming and plunged into the pool to rescue the helpless victim. The youngster was Winston Churchill. His parents, deeply grateful to the gardener, asked what they could do to reward him. He hesitated and then he said, I wish my son could go to college and someday be a doctor. We'll pay his way, Churchill's parents agreed. Years later, when Sir Winston Churchill was Prime Minister of England, he was stricken with pneumonia. Greatly concerned, the king summoned the best physician who could be found to the bedside of the ailing leader. That doctor was Sir Alexander Fleming, the developer of penicillin. He was also the son of the gardener who had saved Winston Churchill from drowning as a boy. Later, Churchill said, rarely has one man owed his life twice to the same person. What was a rare case in that case of that great English statement is, is as much a deeper sense to us, a wonderful reality as believers in Christ. You see, the Heavenly Father has given us the gift of physical life. And then as believers, through his son, the great position he has imparted to us, eternal life. May the awareness that we are doubly indebted to God as our creator and redeemer motivate us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him. Just to give us some context on where we're going this morning, usually I give you the context after we read, but... Stay with me, because the one main point is a big deal today, and you're going to have to track with me. You can't be thinking about where you're going to lunch right now, because you've got to hang with me on this one, all right? So here we are, context. Genesis 131 begins and says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Remember, friends, that we're living in the flawed version of creation right now. We're in the flawed version. So when, when God created everything, he looked at it and said, very good. Now, let, now think about this, friends. This is God. He's perfect God. He's limitless God. And he's saying creation is very good. So it was pleasing in the eyes of God. When the heavens and the earth were created, they were created without flaw. God looks upon his creation. He says, this is very good. This is very good. So what happened? Well, fast forward over to chapter 2. We see in verses 15 through 17 the, that the Lord God put the man in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So over in chapter 3, we remember... That we saw that says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired and make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were opened. Wait a second. They're, they're still there. The lightning bolt didn't come down and boom, boom. Kill him, right? The text says, you shall sure, in that day, you shall surely die. Did they die? Well, turn with me to chapter 5 of Genesis as we look at the result of this action that we call the fall. Verse 1 of chapter 5. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man. Perhaps you didn't know that Adam is, in Hebrew, is man. And he named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son as his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters, 
Thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh 807 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus all of the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. Enosh lived after he fathered Kenan 815 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he fathered Mahaliel. Kenan lived after he fathered Mahaliel 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all of the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. When Mahaliel lived 65 years, he fathered Jared. Mahaliel lived after he fathered Jared 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, the, all the days of Mahaliel were 895 years, and he died. When Jared had lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all of the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. When Enoch lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all of the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all of the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. When Lamech lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all of the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Notice that we see this repetition of this phrase, and he died. When sin entered the world, friends, death entered the world. You see that repetition of, and he died. So God makes this covenant with Adam, and Adam violates the covenant. God says, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of the, of, of the, tree of, the knowledge of good and evil. He does it. And as a result of that, Adam, Adam experiences this break in fellowship with God that affects him, but it also affects all of his descendants that we're reading about here. And it affects you and I as well, because, of course, we read over in chapter 2 that Adam and Eve were the father of all of humanity. And so you and I, friends, are the beneficiary of their choice and their decision uh, to fall away out of fellowship with God. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in speaking about the, the text in Romans, that, that, that verse 23 in chapter 3 is this crescendo of all that the Apostle Paul has been writing about in the book of Romans up to that point. We're studying that on Wednesday nights, and we've been going through verse by verse Romans, and we see this idea of the total depravity of humanity and the fact that, that created in the image of God, the imagio Deo, as we talked about, couple of weeks ago, we are spirit. The real us is spirit, but that spirit is flawed. It's a sin nature, and for us to enter into God's presence, to enter into the kingdom, we must be born again. That spirit needs to be reborn. It is totally depraved. According to the Lord God, according to what it says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But you fast forward over to chapter 6, and 6.23, the text tells us very clearly, for the wages of sin is 
death. And so when God was talking to Adam, when he told him about the, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when I mean, he says you shall surely die, he was speaking, friends, of spiritual death. But he was also speaking about physical death. Because you see, as long as they lived in the garden, as long as Adam and Eve were in right fellowship with God, they were eating from the tree of life. And they would have lived on and on and on. They would have never physically died. And they would have been in right fellowship with God. So there's this idea of physical death death that you and I will experience, but there's this idea also of spiritual death that as believers, you and I will not have to, praise God, experience. But the wages of sin is death. So every one of us, friends, is deserving of that spiritual death, that eternal separation from God. But the text goes on to say, but the, free, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Praise God for him and for what he did that you and I could not do, that reconciliation. Well, let's go back to our text. Let's go verse by verse, if we will. Uh, I don't want to go every verse and talk about, and he died. But let, let's look overall 11 times. In Genesis, if you look at verse one, we'll see there it says these are the generations. And this is the, actually the second time that we've read this. You may remember, uh, but the Hebrew language identifies this phrase as the Toledo. And so there are 11 Toledo, as we read about in the text. And you're getting a little uh, a little theology here. You're getting a little uh, a little college biblical studies insight into our, our, our text today. And we're looking at the Toledo. It identifies, it's like saying, this is the history of, or this is the account of. That phrase is, is really followed by a name in every one of the ten, except for that first one that we read a couple of weeks ago where it says heaven and earth. And so that first toll, though, is heaven and earth and the creation there. But the rest of them are following, followed by names. So that first toll, though, that's the prologue there. And the one that follows are, are, are different episodes that we're seeing throughout the book of Genesis. So we have the Toledos of Adam, we have Noah, we have Noah's sons, we have Shem, we have Terah, we have Ishmael, we have Isaac, we have Esau twice, interestingly, and then we also have Jacob as our, our 11 <coughs> Toledo. The other way we recognize Genesis is that division of chapters 1 through 11, which covers a, a span of, a, of thousands of years. And then chapter 12, it slows down and it pairs down to look at, at the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their family history. And them coming into becoming God's chosen people, if you will. So that, that history slows down at that point. Now... I want to hit you really with, with a 30,000 foot look at the book of Genesis so that we get a little, a, a little theological perspective. All right, so, so first off, we, we learn that God is creator. We, you read the book of Genesis clearly at the beginning there, you see God is creator. And then we see this entrance in the, the entrance of sin into the created order, which radically alters the origin of creation. You see, it wasn't just Adam and Eve that were altered at this at this moment in time, friends. The very fiber of the universe was irrevocably altered. Irrevocably altered. You know, when, when God talks about the curse will be the ground, that is that is just a, a merism, a figure of speech of a description of the altering of, of the of the known universe. And that's why, as we, if we were to read over in 1 Peter, when it talks about the, the recreation, it talks about that all of the elements will be melted with extreme heat. So you and I will be drawn out into space, and then there you'll, you'll, you'll have a destruction of the known universe. And when it says melting of the elements, what it's talking about is the, the very molecules, the very atoms of this creation will be completely evaporated. Why? Because it's flawed. It's flawed. And then the creation of the new heaven and the new earth, you have that judgment at the Bema seat for God's elect, and then the judgment at the great white throne of the wicked, and they're thrown into the lake, lake of fire, eternal separation from God, and then we, in the new heaven and the new earth that will be created, will spend eternity with the Lord. But this creation has irrevocably been altered. Next, we see in, in, in Genesis that God's judgment comes upon sin at every point, at every point. 
You know, as, as we look at the New Testament, you know, we, we, like to like, we like to talk about the love of God. And God's a loving God. And His love is unlimited. God is unlimited in all of His qualities. And His love is unlimited. But His holiness is unlimited as well. And so there's this dichotomy of these, these two things that exist in God's persona that, that pull. There's, the, there's a tension that pulls between love and holiness that creates this necessity for judgment. And so as we look at that and we say, well, how can flawed humanity be reconciled to holy, perfect God? And the solution, the perfect solution, the unsolvable riddle, if you will, is the God-man, Jesus Christ. And so you see that, that initial promise of redemption there, the hope of the destruction of evil, and the promise of redemption there in Genesis chapter 3.15 but God's judgment comes upon sin at every point. God is a judgmental God. But he sustains creation and humanity by his unmerited favor. Unmerited favor, grace. Grace. Not earned, given freely. Not earned, given freely. His unmerited favor, he sustains creation. God is not a God, friends, who just set everything in motion, set the world spinning and stepped back and said, all right, well, I wonder what's going to happen next. And just left it to itself. You know, in, in, our, in our minds we say, well, I know that. I know God is sovereign. I know, I know God is, is over all things and he's in control and, and we're accountable to him and so forth. And, you know, if I were to reason with you about that, you'd say, well, it would have to be that because otherwise he wouldn't be God. But then as we look at as we begin to look at things and we say, well, you know. There has to be this element of, of sentience on the, part of, on the part of humanity. And there is that to a degree. But make no mistake, friends. God's plan is in play. And it's playing out exactly the way that he has ordained it to play out. You and I are actively involved and engaged in that master plan. And ultimately, it's God's divine plan to bring maximum glory to himself. And he will do this through his divine grace by reconciling humanity to himself. Oftentimes as we look at salvation, as we talk about salvation, we think that salvation is all about humanity. And as we look at this creation, we oftentimes think that, that it's all about humanity and, and, and all of us and so forth. And that God is this, this all-powerful genie that can, that can serve humanity and you know, that, that salvation is, is, is all about humanity. When in fact, friends, salvation is the vehicle to God's master plan to bring maximum glory to himself. Because it's not all about you and I. It's all about him. It's all about him. So this curse of separation from God requires this act of reconciliation. There's reconciliation that, that, that's required. There's that separation. And, and God illustrates that by banishing Adam and Eve from the garden to illustrate that separation from God. Remember, we, we had that, that sermon on the garden. The garden was a representation of God's presence. And when they were sent away from the garden, Adam and Eve, the, you see a physical representation of that separation of humanity from God. Now, as I mentioned, the promise of deliverance from the curse becomes progressively more and more clear as we move through biblical history. It's very, very unclear very nebulous there in 315. And it's not really even a promise of a redeemer as much as it is a promise of the destruction of evil. Now, let's think about that. Let's bring that forward to today. And let's look around, if we will, at the earth, at, at the world, at America, at all of the, the other countries, you know, at the Taliban, at all of the nastiness and the evil, despicable things that are going on. And... If we forget who and whose we are, friends, it would be very easy to lose hope. But remember the promise. The promise is that evil will be destroyed. Evil has already been vanquished. It's already been vanquished. So we see that promise beginning in 315 and progressively we see it become more and more clear throughout salvation history. And as we look back at the point of Christ rising from the dead, if you look back in biblical history, 
we can easily look back and see all of the prophecies that have been given about Messiah and about Redeemer and so forth. And they're very, very clear to us, you know, and we studied that for a whole year in Matthew. We looked at the, those, those promises and the looking back of all of those prophecies that were given about Messiah and who Messiah is and what he will do and, and all of that. But remember, friends, for those folks that are trudging through biblical history in the Old Testament and all of these times that we're reading about here, it was not as clear. But make no mistake, salvation by faith in the promise of a Redeemer was always where salvation resided. The promise of redemption moving up to Jesus Christ. And now the, the, the promise of what Jesus did, salvation by faith in Christ, as we look back on that. But look at what the text says in, in, in chapter 5, verse 28, as we talk about redemption and that progression of, of revelation, if you will. Remember, when Lamech, this isn't the evil Lamech that we learned about last week, it's a different Lamech. How'd you like to be named after somebody? How'd you like to have your name be Charles Manson? You know? No, I'm not that. I'm not that Charles Manson. You know, you, you, you got a, a negative connotation. So, so God gives him a blessing here. Look what he does. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son. Notice that it says he fathered a son. It doesn't say it just named it like all the rest of them are named. It says he fathered so and so. But here, the text gives us a Hebrew language, a very, very visual, very poetic language. And so, it's like you'll pause right there and say, "Well, wait, there's there's something different about this one." So you see what it says. He fathered a son. And he fathered a son and called his name Noah. Now, of course, everybody knows who Noah is, right? So he fathered Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed. See, he's pointing back to the curse. This one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. And so God grants him not only the blessing of having the Redeemer there at, at the time. Of course, Noah's the, the Redeemer of, of humanity at the time. He gets in, the, he builds the ark. He spends a hundred years, by the way, of, of his time and in, engages his labor force, his family. Of course, you know, as you look at biblical history, the labor force were, were, were our kids. Not so much in, in 21st century America, but back then your labor force were your, were your kids. So as we look at that, see, so Lamech gets, gets the, the blessing of having Noah as, as that redeemer of humanity, but he gets to prophesy that he's going to be the redeemer. So here again, we see that even after 12 generations between Adam and Noah, only 12 generations, only 12, there still exists a hope of reconciliation and the belief of the promise of a redeemer. So Lamech predicts that this redeemer will be Noah, and he's right, sort of. He's sort of right. So we're going to study that in a few weeks, by the way. So hang in there with me. We'll, we'll, we'll get to the Noah story and the flood and all that goes with that. So the need for salvation is a is, is persistent theme throughout biblical history. But ultimately, we know that it is fulfilled in solely in Jesus Christ, in his salvific actions on earth and on the cross and in, in rising from the dead. Salvation is by faith in Christ alone. It has always been by faith, faith in Christ alone. For all time. Prior to the coming Messiah, it was by the belief in the promise of a coming Redeemer. We see that Lamech, not the bad one from the last week of the good one, the Noah's dad believes Noah's going to be the Redeemer. But for us as believers, we know that salvation is by faith in Christ alone. Now, if we were to bump over to the Gospel of John in chapter 3, we would remember that conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. Of course, Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. And he says, hey, I, I know you're from God, otherwise you wouldn't be able to do all of these things. And so Jesus, of course, his mission never varied. He, he goes right into evangelism. He says, I tell you the truth, unless one is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom. And you've heard me say a number on a number of occasions that that word in the Greek, anathen, can mean again. You know, we remember President Jimmy Carter made, made that born again Christian phrase a, a famous one. And we say born again Christian, but it could mean from above. That uh, anathen can mean from above, or it can mean again. And we don't know whether Jesus was saying from above or again, or whether he was playing on the word and, and saying both. Kind of, kind of means both, if you think about it, because when you're regenerated, your, your spirit is born again, but it's from above. It's from the spirit. It's not something that you and I do. 
It's not my works, so that no one should boast. So you see that, that, that story of Nicodemus, and he talks about Anna then and born again and that regeneration. Well, what does it mean? What does is, what is born again or born Anna then mean? Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, I, can, I can flip over there and, and you can come with me to Titus. It's the last T of all those T's. Remember, it's 1 Second Tim Timothy, 1 Second Thessalonians, Titus. So you go there. Titus chapter 3. And in verse 4 of Titus 3 is a clear description of what we're talking about. But when the goodness and loving kindness, loving kindness, by the way, is just another word for grace. When the goodness perfect goodness of God, by the way, and loving kindness, grace of God, our Savior, appeared. He saved us. Who saved us? He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. There's nothing, not of ourselves. Not of ourselves. But according to His own mercy. How? By the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, whenever you see a so that, that's a purpose statement. So the purpose statement of all of what he just said, so that being justified, past tense, being justified by his grace, we might become heirs, future tense, heirs according to the hope of eternal life. There's your description of that process of regeneration, and you see it's an action that's done by God on us so that it's not a work, it's not something that you and I, that you and I do. See, remember, we're, we're rewinding back to, this, to the story, you shall surely die, physical death, spiritual death, but the promise of Redeemer, and now we begin to understand the truth about how flawed humanity is reconciled to perfect God. So if you want to flip over to Romans, since we're doing some sword drills this morning, to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, there describes the evidence of what happens. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart... One believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Now, if I go back here, because if you confess, that word confess means to say with, to agree with, that Jesus is Lord. Now, you may remember that word Adonai used as, as Lord, but here that word is kurios. Kurios is a, is a different description of Lord. Kurios, is, the connotation is he's large and in charge. Amen. He's large and in charge. Think about it, okay? I say it that way so you remember it. Large and in charge. He is God. When you, when you confess your mouth, God is God, but he's also in charge, which means that I'm accountable to him. So, I mean, even the demons believe and they shudder, but they don't acknowledge him as in charge. So I gotta, I gotta confess he's God. They know he's the demons know he's God, but they don't, they don't, they are not surrendered underneath of his authority. So there's this acknowledgement of being accountable to God. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is kurios and believe in your heart. See, that's that, that that's not, not confessing with your mouth only, right? It's, it's not crossing the finish line here at, at the invitation and just saying, well, you know, I came forward, I prayed the sinner's prayer. That's something that I can do with my mouth, but it has to come from the heart. I have to know that I know that I know, right? That's believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. In other words, as much as you know your own name is true, and no one could ever convince you that that's not your name. Believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead. It's not one of those things, well, you know, I wasn't there. And, you know, a lot of people say it, and they say, well, you've got you to have faith. So I'm not sure, but I have to have, that's not saving faith, friends. Believing in your heart, the assurance, the conviction of things not seen, that we know that we know that we know, that is a demonstration. It's an outward expression and an inward understanding of the truth. And so Ephesians 2.8, we're saved by grace. Through faith, 
And that is not of yourself. It's a gift from God, but not by works so that no one should boast. I want to break that apart. We're saved by grace, unmerited favor, through faith, assurance, conviction. And this is not of yourself. So if I go back and I look at those words in the Greek, if I look at grace and faith, they are it written in the feminine for you Greek scholars. All right? But if I go over to that word this, it's written in the neuter. Now, if it was written in the feminine, then I would have to go back and I would have to see that it is pointing to the first of those two words. It would say, this grace is not of yourself. But because it's written in the neuter, I have to look at it as a phrase. Grace through faith is not of ourself. It's a gift from God. So not only is God's unmerited favor a gift to you, but your faith is too. Wow. Wow. But see, it has to be that way. It has to be that way because there's nothing that you and I can do to earn our way into the grace of God. So our text today reveals that to us that God is faithful. He always does what he says he will do. That's a transferable quality of God, by the way. Did you know that? As Christians, we can be faithful. We can always do what we say we'll do. We can always not do what we say we're not going to do, too. Faith. Faithful. Faithful. So the wages of sin are indeed death. Humanity will experience physical death as a result of the fall. And if a person does not believe that salvation comes through faith in Christ alone, he will experience spiritual death as well. Sadly. Sadly. But we have a Redeemer. Think of the thousands upon thousands, just like Lamech, who hoped that this would be the promised one. And yet, many times, we take this for granted. We take it for granted what has been done in us and for us and through us. Let me see if I can put this into perspective and I hope I can get through this. It's powerful. It's very powerful. There once was this turnable bridge which spanned a large river. During most of the day, the bridge sat parallel with the tracks allowing ships to pass freely on both sides. At certain times each day, a train would come along and the bridge would be turned sideways across the river, allowing the train to cross. A switchman sat in a small shack on one side of the river where he operated the controls to turn the bridge and to lock it into place as the train crossed. One day, as the switchman was waiting for the last train of the day to come, he looked off into the distance through the dimming twilight and caught sight of the train's light. He stepped to the controls and waited until the train was within the prescribed distance when he was to turn the bridge into position. To his horror, he found that the locking control didn't work. If the bridge was not locked into position securely, it would wobble back and forth at the ends when the train came onto it. This would cause the train to jump the track and to go crashing into the river. He left the bridge, turned across the river, and he hurried across the bridge to the other side where there was a lever that he could use to operate the lock manually. He could hear the rumble of the train now. He took hold of the lever and leaned backward to apply pressure to keep the mechanism locked. Many lives depended on this man's strength. Then... Coming across the bridge from the direction of his control shack, he heard a sound that made his blood run cold. Daddy, where are you? His four-year-old son was crossing the bridge to look for him. His first impulse was to cry out to the child, run, run, but the train was too close and his tiny legs would never make it across the bridge in time. The man almost lifted the lever to run and snatch up his son and carry him to safety, but he realized that he could not get back to the lever in time. Either people on the train or his son must die. He took only a moment to make his decision. The train sped safely and swiftly on its way, and no one aboard was aware of the tiny broken body thrown mercilessly into the river by the rushing train. Nor were they aware of the pitiful figure of a sobbing man still clinging tightly to the lever long after the train had passed. 
They didn't see him walking home more slowly than he had ever walked to tell his wife how he had sacrificed their son. Now, if you can comprehend the feeling that went through this man's heart, you can understand the feeling of our Heavenly Father when he sacrificed his son to bridge the gap between us and eternal life. How does God feel when we speed along through life without giving a thought to what was done for us through his son Jesus? Can there be any wonder that he caused the earth to tremble and the skies to darken when his only son died? And so, friends, for our challenge this week in our daily quiet time, remember, the wages of sin is death. Every one of us deserves the lake of fire. We deserve it. We've earned it. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So the question is this. Do we express to the degree worthy the gratitude that he deserves for what he did for us? Let's meditate on that this week. Will you do it? Let's pray.